My name is Russell. I'm the man whose adventures you will hear about in the mystery theater, which follows right away. Hello, headquarters. This is Patrolman Witt reporting for police call box number five at Drake Avenue. Any orders? Not any. Okay. Here? No. This beat is quiet as a church tonight. Yep. Goodbye. What the hell? Gunshots. Came from that direction, too. Here, here. What's going on? Oh, the policeman. I'm glad you came along. Officer, my name's Murray. I what are you wanna... doing with that gun? Drop it. Yes, sir, but I want to report a murder. Wait a minute. This man here, he's dead. Who is he? Hmm? I don't know. Oh, you don't, eh? Put your hands up. You're under arrest. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Jeffrey Barnes welcoming you to the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. You have just heard the opening scene of tonight's exciting story. It is entitled The Eleventh Juror, written by Vincent Starrett and presents one of the most unusual court trials in mystery fiction. You have just heard the committing of the murder and the arrest of the accused, James Murray. But on with the trial. We take you now to the jury room where you will meet the leading character of Vincent Starrett's dramatic story, The Eleventh Juror. Yes, my name is Russell. Steve Russell. I'm the eleventh juror of the jury assigned to the case of the people versus James Murray. We've been out for two and a half days, and every ballot we've taken has had the same results. Eleven to one for a guilty verdict. I'm the one. I'm the holdout. And by now, my fellow jurymen are crying to go home and beginning to hate me. Hate me because I won't go along with them and hang an innocent man. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, please. Now, wait a minute. Quiet down. Now, look here, Mr. Dean. Being foreman of this jury doesn't give you the privilege of riding roughshod. I demand that we take another ballot. Riding roughshod. Huh. Look who's talking. Mr. Russell. As you well know, we've had 27 ballots now. And unless you're ready to change your hold vote... Hold on, I... hold on. How do you know some of the others won't change their vote? Now, let him have his ballot, Dean. Maybe it'll make him see the light. Uh, okay. Uh, so we'll have another ballot. Get out the pencils, boys. Uh, we well, go. I got writer's cramp. Can't we just have a voice vote? Yeah, that's an idea. Okay. Okay. Voice vote it is. And, Russell, if you lose this time, I hope you'll get over your pig-headedness and come along with us. I'm not half as pig-headed as you are, Dean. Oh, you're not, eh? Well, let me tell come you... Come on, come on. Are we going to vote or aren't we? All right. All right. All who vote guilty, say aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. Eleven to one. Same old song and dance. Well, I'm sorry, boys, but like I've said before... Unless one of you can prove to me that James Murray had some motive to kill Howard oh, Blessing. Oh, be hanged. Murray was drunk. He shot Blessing in a drunken rage. Oh, don't waste your breath arguing with him. In two hours, the judge will be calling this a mistrial. And then some other jury can put the noose around Murray's neck. Well, they all want to hang Murray so that they can go home. Well, who doesn't want to go home? I dare say my business suffers from my absence more than theirs does. You know, if it wasn't for Dean, I think my argument about James Murray having no motive for this killing would carry more weight. Because Murray didn't have any motive. He didn't have any at all. Uh, let me tell you about the trial, and you'll see what I mean. Uh, just, just the highlights. First, there was a testimony of Patrolman Witt. He was a policeman who made... Continue, Officer Witt. Well, I, I ran in the direction I heard the shots come from. Uh, Howard Blessing lay dead with two bullets in him. James Murray stood there just looking at the gun in his hand, sort of dazed like. Uh, I could tell he'd been doing a lot of drinking. Now, how long between the time you heard the shots and the time you reached the scene, Officer? Mm, about uh, half a minute. Then isn't it possible that someone other than Murray could have fired the shots, dropped the gun, and run, 
leaving Murray to pick the gun up before you reach the scene? Well, uh, Never mind, that's all. State's witness. <laughs> Officer Witt, is it not so that the murder took place directly beneath the street light? Yes, sir. When you rounded the corner of Belvedere and Lambeth, a quarter block away, did you see anyone else in the street, anyone at all? No, sir, not a soul. Just the prisoner, James Murray, and the deceased, Howard Blessing. There you are, gentlemen. Why, the defense is evidently trying to confuse you by implying that some unknown murderer exists. Had anyone else fired those shots and run, leaving poor Mr. Murray holding the gun, Officer Witt would have seen this unknown man in the streetlight. Objection! Even the prosecutor could run out of the range of the streetlight inside of a few seconds. We are wasting time, Your Honor. I am not concerned with a mythical murderer, a galloping ghost. We are concerned with James Murray, caught standing over a dead man and holding a smoking revolver in his hand. Mrs. Pearson, uh, you live on the ground floor apartment on Lambeth Avenue near Belvedere? Yes, sir. Uh, tell the court what you heard about two o'clock on the night of the murder. Well, I was sitting by the window when I heard two men pass by. They were arguing. You have heard the prisoner speak. Was either of the voices his? I beg your pardon? I said, uh, was either of the voices you heard that of the prisoner? Certainly not. One man had a kind of whiny voice. The other was deep and rumbly-like. Gentlemen, Howard Blessing, the murdered man, had a whiny voice. We can prove that. James Murray is far from having a deep one. That's all, Mrs. Pearson. Thank you. Your witness, Mr. Prosecutor. Uh, Mrs. Pearson, Mrs. Pearson, you didn't see these men, did you? Uh, what was that? I say, you didn't see the men? Oh, no, it was too dark. Yes, but you heard them plainly. How? But you heard them. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Pearson... Did you hear the shots fired a few minutes later? Beg pardon? I said, did you hear the revolver shots? No, Gentlemen, but I... Gentlemen, Mrs. Pearson heard two men arguing through a closed window, yet she couldn't hear three pistol shots less than a block away. She can barely hear my questions in this room. That's all, Mrs. Pearson. <laughs> uh, Mr. Trapp. You've known the deceased, Howard Blessing, for some time? About uh, five years. We were pretty good friends. And you knew Blessing was a widower, Mr. Trapp, whose wife died some years back? Yes. Did Howard Blessing ever show you a small framed miniature of his wife? Oh, yes, many times. He always carried it with him. Did he show it to you the night he was killed? Yes. Did you see him put it back on his person? Uh, yes. Yes. What is the point of this line of questioning? I am trying to establish, Your Honor, that this miniature disappeared. That it was taken from the murdered man by some unknown person. That's all, Mr. Trapp. Prosecution's witness. No questions. <laughs> Mr. Murray... How did you happen to be at Belvedere and Lambeth at the time of the murder? Well, I, I was on my way home. I had had several drinks. I, I don't know, frankly, how I got where I was. I, well, I, well, I was just there. Did you have a gun on your person when you left the Black Owl Tavern to go home? Oh, certainly not. Mr. Murray, did you ever know or hear of the deceased Howard Blessing until the morning of your arrest? Oh, never. So help me God, I, I never knew him, never heard of him. He was a total stranger? Yes, a total stranger. That's all. Prosecution's witness. Uh, Mr. Murray, Mr. Murray, where do you live? 102 Bedford Road. And you were drinking at the Black Owl Tavern on Oak Street? Yes, sir. Then how could you have been on your way home at Belvedere and Lambeth? Well, I, I don't know. I just wandered that way. I see, and in your wandering, Mr. Murray, you plucked a gun out of thin air, huh? Oh, no, that, that is, I... I don't know how I got it. Gentlemen, gentlemen, why go on? In summing up Mr. Murray's testimony, we find that he says he was innocent, but admits he was too drunk to know. We find that he was on his way home, but going in the opposite direction. We learn that Mr. Murray didn't have a gun with him. But gentlemen, the gun found in his hand and marked Exhibit A on that table, that is no mirage. Nor was the dead Howard blessing a mirage. Nor the bullets that killed him. That is stark truth. That is murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't like to 
Now, what has the defense offered as proof of Murray's innocence? A witness so hard of hearing that she couldn't hear revolver shots, yet who claims she heard two men argue as they passed her window. A vague story about a miniature which the dead man didn't have on his person. And then the fact that Murray didn't know Blessing. Oh, that is a honey. Is Blessing any less dead because he was a stranger to this, this gun-toting drunkard? No, gentlemen. Murray killed Blessing. Stranger or not, he's guilty. Murray must hang. Well, those were the highlights of the trial. Oh, I admit the circumstantial evidence against James Murray is pretty strong. But the judge said if there was any reasonable doubt in our minds as to whether Murray killed Howard Blesson, we should find Murray innocent. <laughs> well, there's plenty of reasonable doubt in my mind. Oh, that must be the bailiff coming in to ask if we reached a decision. Yeah, the two hours have passed. Oh, well, now it looks like we'll have to admit a mistrial. Well, boys, this is it. I'll let him in. Oh, just a minute, Dean. You dropped something. Huh? What? What did I drop? Oh, on the floor here. <laughs> looks like... Looks like it... Holy mackerel. What's the matter, Russell? What is it? Oh, this changes everything. Uh, just a minute, boys. Bailiff, come back in 30 minutes. What does he mean? Hey, what goes? Yeah, what's the idea, Russell? What was that you picked up off the floor? Look here, Russell. What do you think you are telling the bailiff to come back in 30 minutes? You'll find out all too soon, Mr. Dean. Fellow jurors, now you'll have to listen to me. Oh, wait, fellow jurors, fellow jurors, listen to me. You all remember during the testimony that defense made a point out of the fact that a certain miniature bearing the picture of Howard Blessing's wife disappeared from Blessing's pocket just before he was murdered. Yeah, what's that got to do with it? Well, boys, before we decide to hang Murray, perhaps Mr. Dean would like to explain what this miniature happened to be doing in his pocket. And now back to Jeffrey Barnes and Act Two of The Eleventh Juror. James Murray, a smoking gun in his hand, has been found standing drunkenly over the body of one Howard Blessing. All the jurymen, with the exception of Steve Russell, believe Murray is guilty of murder. Russell has held out for nearly three days. Just as the foreman of the jury, a Mr. Dean, is about to report a mistrial to the court, Russell electrifies the jury room by demanding to know how a mysterious miniature, supposedly belonging to the murdered man, has found its way into Dean's pocket. For the tenth time, fellow jurymen, I tell you, I never saw that miniature before in my life. And I don't know how it could have gotten into my pocket. And Dean's the man, my friends, who wouldn't believe James Murray when he said he didn't know how that gun got in his hand. How about that, Dean? Uh, your story about... doesn't hold water, Dean. Uh, take it easy, will you, fellas? All right, boys, just a minute, just a minute, please. Just a minute. I think this thing has gone far enough now. I've made my point. Huh? What point, Russell? Uh, here's what Dean dropped out of his pocket. Well, I'll be... That's my watch fob. What? Your watch fob? Hey, what goes here? Yeah, what is this, Russell? Yeah, what are you trying well, boys, to Boys, when it? Dean accidentally dropped that watch fob on the floor, I saw my chance to teach all of you a lesson. A lesson? I picked it up, said it was the miniature. Then slipped it in my pocket and watched you fellas swarming all over Dean. Ready to hang him at the drop of the hat. Oh, on circumstantial know. evidence. Circumstantial evidence, mind you. Now, don't you see that you're doing the exact same thing to James Murray? No one actually saw him shoot Howard Blessing. And Murray was too drunk to know what happened. I claim somebody else could have shot Blessing, shoved the gun into Murray's hand and beat it. Now, wait a minute, Russell. I admit you've made us all look like fools over this watch fob. But that doesn't prove your story about an unknown killer. Not for my money, it doesn't. Oh, yeah. oh why not? Perhaps a hold-up man, a, a thug killed Blessing. Oh, why wasn't his money taken? Oh, yeah. well, okay, so it wasn't a hold-up man. Perhaps it was some enemy of his. Why, there could have been a hundred different reasons why somebody might have wanted to kill Blessing. Oh, yeah? Name one. Name one? <laughs> I could give you a dozen right here and now. I said give just one. What's the matter, Russell? Did he call you a bluff? Yeah, you yeah. can't even name one. Uh, no, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do I understand you fellas to mean that if I can make up a story showing how Blessing was killed, you'll admit there's a reasonable doubt of Murray's guilt? Huh? Why not? Well, I for one would, anyhow. How about the rest of you? Well, yes, oh, you can give it. Big okay, story. sit tight and hold your hats. As I said, I can make up a dozen different stories. So this is just one way the murder might have happened. 
Now, let's say about 10 years ago, in a small Ohio town, there's a guy named Smith. Well, let's call him, call him George Smith. Ten years ago. Some star. Quiet, Dean. Now, give him a chance. Smith's standing on the station platform with a girl. And we'll call her Elsie. She's crying a little, and he's talking to her. He says... I don't want to go, sweetheart. But I can't make a set in this burg. You want to marry me, don't you, dear? And she says... Yes, darling, yes. And I know you're right. I know Father won't let us marry till you've got money and a good job. But it might take so long, and I love you so much. There, you get the picture? Smith is leaving for the big city to make lots of money so the old man will okay his marrying Elsie. Well, the train's about to go, and they kiss. And Smith hops aboard, shouting... Wait for me, darling. Wait. And she says... Forever, George, forever. Well, get this. She doesn't wait. No, 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 no. It's not her fault. Another guy comes on the scene. He's a rat of a guy with flashy clothes and a fast line of patter. And he works on Elsie, real slow and smooth. And the rat says... Hi, Elsie. Was talking to Tommy in the barber shop today. Said he heard George was doing well in Chicago. He says his father saw George at one of the hot spots there when he was in Chicago last month. Yeah, uh, you see, you see? This home base robber starts slow, but let's say in about a year he's got Elsie so she believes most anything. Now, Look, oh, he... Russell, I don't see what this corny story of yours has to do with the case. Dean, let me finish. Okay, shoot. By the way, Russell, who is this rat? Suppose we say his name's... Howard Blessing. What? Huh? Oh, Blessing? A murdered man? Hey, what are you getting at? Shut up and let him talk. Now, what happens next, Russell? Well, Smith had no way of figuring out why when his letters weren't answered. He stays on in the city and finally a wedding announcement reached him. Just a wedding announcement. So Blessing has ruined the boy meets girl routine, eh? Right, right. Now let's say Smith knows Blessing from way back. Well, it burns him up, see? Mr. and Mrs. Blessing instead of Mr. and Mrs. Smith, get it? But he's a right sort, so he swallows it. Only it hurts going down. Brother, have you got an imagination? You ought to write for the movies. <laughs> he sure should. But what's all this got to do with Murray? Why do you interrupt so much, Dean? Well, don't you want me to finish the story? Well, I... Well, I have no objection. All right, then. Shut up. Go ahead, Russell. Right, right. Now, let's say a few years pass, and one day Smith gets a letter. And it's a letter from the girl's mother. It's a sad letter saying... Dear George... My baby married a fiend whose brutality and unfaithfulness finally became more than she could bear. We found my poor little girl hanging in her cellar last Monday a suicide. Howard Blessing is as much a murderer as though he had done it. So let's say the letter went something like that, huh? Now, if you fellows sat in judgment on Blessing, what would you do? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Are you guys going to let him go on with his third-rate version of East Lynn? There's no skin off your nose, Dean. Now, look, Dean, this is the third time you've interrupted. Are you sure you haven't some reason why Russell shouldn't finish the story? Why, no. Okay, go ahead, Russell. Yeah, go ahead. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right. All right. Well, let's imagine Blessing caught sight of Smith in town one day. Might make a guy like Blessing carry a gun from then on, mightn't it? Might. Well, we suppose so, anyhow. Fine. Out comes the night of the murder. Smith runs into Blessing on Lambeth Avenue. Smith says he's going to beat Blessing's head off. They go up the street arguing. And that's what the Pearson woman heard through her window. Yeah. Yeah, they get to the corner, and Blessing begins to whine. He takes out the miniature of his dead wife, Elsie, and he shows it to Smith. And Blessing says... Smith, look, I want to show you something. Look, I loved Elsie. Here, I've got her picture. Would I carry it with me if I hadn't loved her? Well, that's all Smith needs, the sight of that picture. He slaps it out of Blessing's hand and grabs him by the collar. Blessing pulls a gun out of his pocket. Smith grabs his hand and says, Give me that gun, you idiot. Blessing pulls the trigger. Once. And Smith grabs Blessing's wrist. Smith wants to protect himself, you see. Uh, All right, all right. The men struggle. And suddenly the gun goes off. Twice. Blessing is hit. He goes down. Right there is where Murray comes up. He staggers up, drunk as a hoot owl. And then Smith scoops up the miniature and beats it, leaving Murray standing over the dead man. Then the cop rushes up, sees Murray, and Murray's on the way to the gallows. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely right. And that, boys, is one story of how it might have happened. Yes. Well, well, I could imagine. Yeah. 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 You know very well it could. Because they yeah. yeah. the gun, then they think he's the guy. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, now, uh... You want to hear a few more possibilities? Not me. Oh, I'm convinced there's plenty of reasonable doubt about Murray's guilt. I vote for acquittal. I do, too. All right, let's make that official. Let's make it official. All in favor of acquittal signify by saying aye. 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 Well, that does it. I think we're now ready to inform the court that we've reached a verdict. Not so fast. What? I haven't voted yet. A few questions. Yes, Dean? You say you made this story up? That's right. Then it proves nothing, right? Sure it does, Dean. It proves somebody besides Murray might have killed Blessing. 
It proves reasonable doubt. Not in my book, it doesn't. I still think Murray is guilty. So this is still a mistrial. What? Oh, right oh, back where we start. This is the last straw. So let's call the bailiff and get it over with. Oh, what are you bailiff! Bailiff! He'll be here in a minute, and what do you think of that, Russell? Well, I, I think I'm licked. Huh? I think I can't stall any longer. Huh? Dean, I've convinced everyone but you. Now I'm going to convince you. Take a look at this. What is it? Now, let me see. What's it? This is a miniature. A miniature? That's right. Then this means that you... That you're... Right again. Take a good look, boys. The George Smith in my story is me. Steve Russell. Oh, wow. Holy mackerel. Gee, Ossifat. By coincidence, luck, chance, I was called on this jury. And then I couldn't stand to see Murray die. Well, where do we go from here? You called me, Foreman? Huh? Oh, uh, yes, Bailiff. You can tell the judge we've arrived at a verdict. Yes, sir. And Bailiff? Yes? Yes, Mr. Dean? Bailiff, step outside a moment. Yes, sir. Boys, we all know Murray is innocent. But what are we going to do about Russell? As you know, the proceedings in this jury room are confidential. Any recommendation we make must be made officially to the court. Now, do we turn Russell over for trial or not? Well? Mr. Foreman, I... Uh... Yes? Well, I... I say we forget Russell's story. What about the rest of you? Dean, in my opinion... Yes? In my opinion, Russell killed Blessing in self-defense. I say we forget about yeah, it. That's a good I idea. Forget about it. Okay, then. It's agreed. We find Murray not guilty and let it go at that. The case is closed. There is an epilogue to tonight's story. Steve Russell eventually, of his own volition, stood trial and was acquitted. Yes, Mr. Fans, I think we can call the 11th jury's attempt to save an innocent man a complete success. This is Jeffrey Barnes again, ladies and gentlemen, inviting you to be with us next week when we will present Eric Ambler's suspenseful study of mortal terror, his popular adventure in mystery entitled Journey into Fear. It was especially adapted for radio by the very popular Milton Geiger. So, mystery fans, be sure to listen next week to Eric Ambler's Journey into Fear. <laughs> The original music for is composed and conducted by Jack Miller. The Eleventh Juror was written by Vincent Starrett and adapted for radio by Christopher Mayo.
This is the Armed Forces Radio Service.